Sophie, thank you so much for joining me. It's lovely to have you here today. Thank you for having me, Maria. You are most welcome. So I've got lots of things to talk to you about, but, but let's, let's start by understanding. Tell me about your business background, because you've done quite a lot in business and people may not know that. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, my business background. I Well, originally I worked for the BBC when I graduated from university, but basically from the mid 90s onwards, I set up a consulting company with my mentor, who was a I think an unsung genius of the 20th century. He was a clinical psychologist, entrepreneur, psychotherapist. And um, I fell in love with his methodology and his approach to um, my effectively mindset change, but it's a lot more than that. So we established a business in the mid nineties and we served many leading brands over the next 20 years, banks, retailers, educators, startups, uh, we primarily delivered leadership, culture change, and customer service programs. Um, but we always specialized in shifting the mindsets and the behaviors that undermined relationships, integrity, and results. So that was my life for 20 years. And I spent um, every week in conference centers and hotels running programs. Fantastic. And I, I love the focus on the, the mindset shift that you mentioned. Yeah. Can you give us an example of a, a big mindset shift that, that you witnessed or experienced? Yeah, I have a few. Um, let me sh share a favorite. So I was working with a, a large, very successful UK retailer and they bought us in to improve their customer service. That was the brief. But we always go in and we do a very uh, deep dive scoping and diagnostic. And um, when we went into the business, what we found was a very fearful culture, um, a lot of bullying. They had 40% staff turnover, 40%. And I went, mm, that is very interesting indeed. And what we uncovered were two prevailing mindsets in the business. So one was, I have to get everything right or I'll be reprimanded and humiliated. And the other was, I have to be positive and hide my stress or I'll be seen as weak or a failure. And these two mindsets pervaded the whole company. And it was really highlighted for me when I, I went to visit one of their stores on a Saturday, and it was a store that um, one of this very, he was a legend in the business, an operational director who everyone was frightened of. And he used to do his shopping, uh, uh, his, his family shopping in this store on Saturday mornings. And product availability was one of their priority KPIs. But what the staff did was they knew what products he wanted to buy, and they would remove them from the shop floor put them in storage in the back, and then they'd send like a meerkat sentry member of staff into the car park to look out for his car. And when his car came, word would be sent to the store, he's coming. And um, all the products would come out and all, all the things he would need would be put back on the shop floor. It was all hands on deck. It was operational excellence for all the wrong reasons. And when he walked in, everyone was smiling, all the products were available, but what he walked into was a lie. And that typified the depth of fear that was running this business. So I eventually was allowed into the hallowed boardroom. I was the first consultant allowed in for 11 years because they were allergic to consultants telling them how to run their very successful business, which is understandable. <clears throat> and I shared this story with the board. And I said, you don't need a customer service program. You need a leadership program because you're bullying, fearful, you're bullying leadership style and your fearful culture are why your staff aren't serving their customers well, because they're too busy trying to serve their frightening managers. And the CEO 
he actually said these words, said, do not remove fear from my business. It's how we get results. Oh, my God. He actually I... said that. <laughs> and in that, in that moment, Maria, I felt this homeopathic dose of terror just ricochet through my whole body on behalf of everyone who worked for him. And I could hear myself thinking, back off, don't blow this. Um, if you keep going, you're going to be humiliated and fired, which was what all his employees were thinking. I was literally in their mindset in that moment. So I took a very deep breath and I was shaking, but I took a very deep breath and I said, that belief is why you have 40% staff turnover and why your people lie to your managers. Wow. And he was a bit resistant for a little bit, but eventually he said, are you telling me we can remove fear from the business and get even better results? And I said, I think that's the only way you can move to the next level as a market leader. So his mindset that fear is how we get results literally ran the entire company. And four days later, he signed off a multi-million pound budget to change the culture. And I, we ended up working with them for five years <clears throat> to do that, but it was a major culture change. That was one of the high points of my life as a consultant was shaking in this boardroom with this very frightening, they were all men. And I was kind of a fledgling consultant at that time, but it was such a clear example of how one leader's belief can permeate an entire business. I mean, that's amazing. That makes me think of lots of things. I mean, one of the things it makes me think of, um, so obviously, you know, I'm part of the London Speaker Bureau group of companies. Yeah. We don't have a turnover. We have to sort of let this let people go when we need to make a change. People don't leave. You know, it's, it's incredible. In our industry, that's really rare. Um, and I mean, I've been with them for 20 years. So that's crazy. Uh, and then the 40, other thing. 40 percent. It was 40 percent. Oh, I'm, it, absolutely unbelievable. And the cost of having to replace people. Um, but I love the story of the fact that they, you know, they set it up and it was a lie. And um, because, it, 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 you know, if you're tracking the wrong things and you've got the wrong culture, people will just deliver what you're tracking. They will they will do what they, they will give you what you want to see. It's it's an amazing example. That's incredible. So so where does creativity fit? Because this is your area, really. Now, creativity yeah. in crisis is what you are really known for. Where does that fit with the mindset? Yeah, very good question. So I think throughout my career, I've um, I've always taught my clients how to bring their most powerful, courageous and creative responses to the curveballs that come in their way. I call those curveballs life shocks. We, we, we're, we get life shocks constantly and we are in the midst of a tsunami of them at this time. Um, so I've always I've always taught people um, how to unleash their creativity in response to the unexpected, the challenging and crisis situations. And I've done that for a long time. And I'll just speak about the mindset side of that in a moment. <clears throat> I think what really put me on a global stage as an authority in this area was the way I responded to being given six months to live over six years ago. I was di diagnosed with terminal cancer. I was given six months to live. And what ensued was the most creative six years of my life. So part of that was finding solutions that I was told did not exist. Part of that was I wrote, I wrote a Sunday Times bestseller and then two more bit books that were all about um, really handling crisis situations. They're all different takes on that. So that also established me as an authority in this territory. And I launched a new career as a speaker and, and I stayed alive. Um, but that made that gave me a public profile in this area. I, I've done a lot of media appearances. Um, I'm, very, I'm a very well-known patient activist. And I think that really established 
establish my power in and my authority in this territory, even though I'd been done, doing it for years. But there was something about that experience put it to me. Can you really walk your talk? Can you really be your brand? <laughs> Can you really um, live what you teach, actually, in the worst situation possible? So that was a really important um, shift for me in, in my whole way of working and in everything I'm doing. And I think the mindset part of that that's really important is I don't teach creativity as a skill set. I help my clients unlock the deep well of creative powers that we all have within us if we can just get out of the way. So our creativity gets blocked by our fears, our anxieties, our beliefs, our unconscious perceptions. So we see the situation we're in through, through the filter of those beliefs and fears and anxieties, which are often not, they're often unconscious, usually unconscious. So when we remove that filter, Maria, when we get the fear out of the way um, and um, the, the deep mindsets that limit our creativity, behold, there is an orchard of possibilities right in front of us. And it's like a, they're dripping with ripe plums waiting to be picked when we, when we, it's like we see the world through a filter of beliefs <clears throat> and then we can't see what's possible. So if you shift the beliefs, the false beliefs, the limiting beliefs, behold, there are all these possibilities awaiting for us. That was certainly my experience when I was dying. I mean, I was, I was dying. But I, um, I found that orchard and possibilities became available to me that I didn't even need to look for. So I think the important thing about creativity isn't that it's a skill or a method. Um, we all have incredible, creative, resourceful powers within us, but they get locked down and blocked by our mindsets. So the secret of unleashing your creativity is transforming your mindset, essentially. And that's what I do with people and with my clients. Sophie, wow. I mean, wow, that was so much there. Um, so much great stuff from the business side and so much personal stuff. Mm. I mean, wow. Uh, I, I, first of all, I have to ask you, are you still dying? Are you living? What is going on with your cancer? I just celebrated my six year cancer anniversary, which was very exciting, but I still have cancer. So the last six years have been brutal, as I often say. Um, they've been wondrous and extremely harsh. I've probably had 60 to 70 brain tumors in the last seven years, six years. So it's an ongoing, I have one as I speak to you now. So I live in crisis every single day. But I also, I'm, I'm also more alive than I've ever been. I'm more productive than I've ever been. I'm more creative than I've ever been. Um, so, and right now I'm well, I'm healthy. Um, I'm doing remarkably well. And part of what keeps me alive, keep, a lot of people said to me, Maria, why are you working? Mm. Why don't you just take care of yourself? And I used to say, because that's a living death to me. That's a, I, I, you know, that I, I want to be in the world. I want to be making a difference. I want to be of service. Um, and I want to be bringing my gifts to the world for as long as I'm on this earth. And I do think that's one of the reasons I'm still here. Um, and I do know that my ability to transform my own fear is also one of the primary reasons that I'm still alive. So yes, I still live with it, but I thrive with it. And of course I have my dark days and my dark hours. I mean, you are actually a, the personification of everything that you're teaching. You really are, you know, because you are, yeah. as you say, every single day you are living in, in crisis. Every single day you are dealing with this, but every single day you are showing up 
you're bringing results and you're showing up a hundred percent you know i've known you a while now you show up 100 percent every single time you don't turn things down you don't make excuses and if anybody if people could have just a pinch of that in their business that is just so powerful incredibly powerful so it's interesting because you say you don't teach how to do it you don't teach the skills you you sort of you help people to see what the filters are and how to unlock it i love the sentence you said unlock the what was it the deep well of creative power that's a wonderful sentence i yeah. love that um and actually you're very eloquent you put things very beautifully um thank you did you know you could write by the way before or was this something you discovered yes i well i wanted to write since i was 10 years old um, I studied English literature and psychology. I always wanted to be a writer, but then I fell in love with um, psychology and um, working with human beings and the human condition. And I met this incredible man who was my, who trained me and taught me most of what I know. So it was interesting when I was diagnosed, part of what happened for me was this tsunami of regret about what I hadn't done with my life. I also used to speak when I I won a big national competition when I was 16. Um, And I stopped speaking and writing for 25 years. Um, So when I was diagnosed, I picked those two things up again because they were two things I'd been passionate about when I was younger. And I finally became the author I'd been wanting to be since I was 10 years old. So that was one of the gifts of perks of cancer. I think there are certain perks and gifts of the whole experience. So, so yeah, I've, I, I, I've always loved writing. I just never did it until the last few years. Fantastic. Um, I, oh, fantastic. And good for you that you've not just stopped at one, but you know, written more than one. Yeah. In fact, my recent book, is called Awakenings in the Time of Coronavirus. And I think it's important because when coronavirus hit, I felt incredibly calm because I'm, uncertainty is my normal. That's my normal. I, I I live with that every day. So I immediately moved my business online and I launched a masterclass to work, support people who were struggling with their fear and anxiety and how do I continue my life in this situation? Um, So I, and and then I bought the book out. So when there's a big crisis now, part, part of what the last six years has done for me is I get very calm and go, oh, I know how to deal with this. I know how to be with this and I know how to help other people respond to this type of situation. Um, so my third book was actually an audio book, but it was very much about um, how I don't I don't think, Maria, we need to pivot at this time. I think that's there's a lot of that word used. Let's pivot your business and actually pivoting keeps you in the same place and just points you in a new direction. I think we're being required to find a new place to find a new place rather than just pivot. And so that's what I've been really helping a lot of my clients work with in the last six months. And I think it's important to say as well, Maria, that um, I do teach skills. I just don't teach skills in how to be creative, which I think other people do. I teach skills in how to uproot and shift unconscious mindsets and beliefs that limit you and hold you back. Those are the skills I teach. And once you know how to make those shifts, the creativity just flows from there. It's like pulling a plug. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. I can visualize that, that's really brilliant. Tell me, is being creative in crisis and in uncertainty different to being creative at any other time? Um, I think it is. Um, I think we can be creative at any time, but there's nothing, I think crisis is the birthplace of creativity. I think it's the birthplace. 
So when we're in a crisis situation, um, it turns the volume up on everything. And what, what we normally settle for and what normally works for us um, and the mindsets that enable us to succeed and get by don't really cut it in crisis situations. So in my experience, when people are in their worst moments, Maria, they find the best in themselves. Often when we're, we're in our worst moments, we, how do we bring our best to our worst moments? And our best is creativity. It's the ability to find possibilities in seemingly impossible situations. And those in seemingly impossible situations call that out. So I do think it's different, yes. That, I love that sentence, you know, finding possibilities in seemingly impossible situations, which is exactly where we are at time of recording. Uh, you know, for many of us, we're thinking, goodness, you know, um, especially in our industry, it's quite tough. So that's really refreshing. Um, one of the things that you're asked to talk about a lot, actually, is uh, the topic of why most transformation isn't transformation. <laughs> so hang on. How is transformation not transformation? Tell me about that. OK, it is actually one of my most booked talks that. So here's what I mean by that. Um, McKinsey research shows that 70% of change programs fail. And that hasn't actually changed for decades, that statistic. And in a relatively recent survey with business leaders, the word transformation topped the, the list of jargon words they want to get rid of, closely followed by millennials and disruption. So, I, I took that very seriously because I, I have called myself um, a transformational facilitator for a really long time, but it's almost as innocuous as calling myself a life coach now because the market is flooded with transformational programs, transformational practitioners, there are transformation departments, transformation directors, um, and and many, many so-called transformational products being offered um, to corporate clients. So we've almost killed that word. It's lost its meaning and it's lost its power. And I think we throw word, uh, uh, there's change, Maria, there's improvement, there's growth, there's evolution, there's adaptation, and there's transformation. Those things are different. They're all quite distinct, but we throw all those in the bucket and call it transformation. Um, and there's even, this is really interesting, there's even, I was, uh, I was invited to speak at a, a corporate gig in Zurich a couple of years ago, and the whole two days was under the banner, sustainable transformation. And um, when I came on, I said, those two words give me cognitive dissonance because a caterpillar becomes a butterfly and a butterfly doesn't need to sustain its butterflyness. It just exists as a butterfly. So if you need to sustain transformation, you haven't yet achieved transformation because transformation is the shift that does not shift back again. And I think that's, I think it's, um, it's also a rare thing I think we overpromise it and under deliver it. And I'm very careful when a client says, can you transform my business? My first question is, do you really need me to do that? Or do you need me to improve your business? Or do you need to grow as a business? Or do you need to adapt to a business? Because if you want to transform, that is gonna be challenging, uncomfortable, expensive. Um, and it requires something that all the other things don't. So I think we need, need to be much more discerning. And I, I really mind about it because it matters and it takes incredible skill, I think, and training 
and integrity to deliver transformation. And if I was a client booking a transformational consultant, the first question I would ask is, what have you transformed in your own life and in your own business? That would be my qualifying question. And it's incredible how many transformational consultants are not transforming their lives and not transforming their businesses. And if you're not up for that and you're not doing it, then don't teach it and don't claim the right to transform your clients if you haven't transformed yourself. Yeah, that's so true. So, so powerful. Um, and actually that applies to so many other things that people are teaching that, you know, if they haven't done it, they shouldn't be teaching it. Or yeah. if, they haven't, if they haven't got case studies where they've managed to do it, they shouldn't be, absolutely brilliant. Such a great question that. Um, I love the the definition that transformation is shift that doesn't shift back. I really mm. like that. And I like the sort of the, the, you know, the explanation of the differences. And in your jargon words, you missed a few, I think. You missed resilience. <laughs> you missed sure. resilience. Don't want to hear that anymore. And also the jargon words that we've been hearing actually around, uh, I mean, you mentioned pivot earlier, but also the, the words we've been hearing around this pandemic. If I hear unprecedented again, I will have an unprecedented reaction. Um, anyway, so that was, yeah, that's really fascinating. Oh, really and fascinating. motivation is another one. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, listen, I could talk to you all day, but we've 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 actually run out of time. So I'd like oh. you I would love you to leave our listeners with with a thought as to what can they do to perhaps to be a bit creative throughout this pandemic. Can you give them a, a tip? Sure. Um there's many. I think my primary tip is <clears throat> acknowledge your fear and do something about it. This is not an intellectual exercise that we're dealing with. This is a time, I'm not gonna say unprecedented. This is an invitation to be profoundly creative and to transform many of the ways we're doing business. I mean, the, the pandemic is toppling our norms, our paradigms, our structures, our ways of working, and frankly, our entitlements. They're all toppling like dominoes. And if you're not afraid, you should be in some way. If you're not going, whoa, <laughs> whoa, and you're pretending you've got this handled, look again. Because when we can acknowledge our fear and our anxiety and our resistance to change, and we bring that close and we stand in the fire of that, then we can break free into whole new ground and whole new territory. So I would say my biggest tip is acknowledge your anxiety and your resistance and do something about it. And the rest will just follow. I'm gonna do that. That's such good advice. Thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. <laughs>